guys so much for being here. I know it's kind of a different time zone for a lot of us. Um, some of us, it's our bedtime. Others of us are just waking up and it's 5 a.m. over in Kenya. So thank you guys so much for attending on behalf of Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Um, welcome to um, Canines in Conservation. So I am the U.S. Outreach Coordinator for Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. I've held this title for about three years now. Um, so over the next two hours or so, uh, we'll be hearing from a variety of speakers that work with domestic dogs, either for the use of like wildlife conservation or just the use of domestic dogs and how they play a role in communities. Um, so this fundraiser will highlight canines and how they can contribute to research, conservation, as well as how they can um, contribute to our communities. So dogs are um, companions, not only in the States, but in a lot of communities in Africa, um, and they do contribute a lot. Um, so one of the things that um, we will be um, highlighting on um, is how they play that role in the community. So um, some of the two, three basic things is um, they're a watchman. So basically like guard dogs, they take care of um, the homestead and as well as the livestock. Um, so this is a free event, um, but it is a fundraiser. So throughout the event, um, there will be opportunities to donate. Um, so you, can donate via our website, actionforcheetahs.org, or by sending donations to our Venmo account, which we'll put up in just a little bit. Um, there you go. So these are a few different ways. Um, basically, $5 will um, pay for a rabies vaccine. So the fundraiser today will be going towards vaccinating cats and dogs in Kenya. Um, so one dollar will get you, or five dollars will get you um, one rabies vaccine donation. Uh, Twenty-five dollars will get you five rabies vaccinations. Um, Seventy-five dollar donation, fifteen um, vaccinations, or a bag of dog food. For those of us that have dogs, we know exactly um, how expensive dog food is. And then we'll put up our Venmo account throughout the night as well. So if you wanna make a donation through our Venmo, uh, we'd greatly appreciate that. Um, some adorable cheetah photos for you um, at the bottom. And then you can also support us by our cool crafts. Uh, so we partner uh, with local Kenyans, um, artisans, they make these beautiful um, crafts. I'm wearing a few now. I have the one, not the bracelets photoed, but one of the bracelets, which I love. I have one of the necklaces on, as well as one of the beaded rings. Um, and then these dog collars, as well as calendars and virtual dog adoption. So you can find all of these on our cool, um, our Shopify account. So the link is right in there. And we'll also put the link in the bio uh, throughout the evening as well. And you can also sign up for our newsletter, actionforcheetahs.org. Yeah, perfect. All righty. So I would like to start the night by introducing uh, Mary Weikstra. She is the founder and executive director of Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. Uh, Mary started the program back in 2001 in affiliation with Cheetah Conservation Fund and the Kenyan Wildlife Service. Since then, she has grown her team and has launched research studies on the ecology and status of the cheetahs in Kenya. Please welcome Mary Weikstra. Thank you very much. And it's nice to see so many familiar faces. And um, thank you all for joining us today, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, I think that Jess, you're going to go ahead and put some slides up for me to follow. Um, but basically, um, we're going to be looking at kind of two different ways that dogs are used. Um, one way is how dogs in the community um, are being used in the community, but also um, 
what it is that we're doing to help strengthen um, the relationship between dogs and people. And so the second way that we're going to be looking at how dogs are, are used in conservation, um, we will highlight what we're doing here in Kenya, but also some of the other ways that dogs are being used in conservation with some of our other speakers. Next slide, please. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just tell you a little bit about what um, the Ginger's Hope campaign is. Um, I'll tell you a tiny bit about some things with our scat dogs, but mostly I will leave that for um, speakers that are gonna be later in the, in the program, um, Cosmos Wambua and Paul McKibia. So in 2004 is when a little dog named Ginger came into my life and she came in when I needed her the most in my life, um, showing me really, I'm a cat person, so there's the cat there with the dog as well, um, but showing me what, what companionship of a dog could really be because she really filled that part of my heart that I needed at that point. Um, Maddie was the first dedicated scat dog to come into our program. And like I said, the guys will tell you, you know, more about that later. And then Artie and Percy um, are the most current dogs that have come in the program. Next slide, please. Um, what we're doing here in Kenya is to um, use the scat that we're finding with scat dogs to look at cheetah diet, health, and genetics. Um, but also, like I said, we're trying to increase the value of, of dogs in communities by doing a program through the Ginger, Ginger's Hope campaign that helps to improve the care of dogs. Next. So again, a little bit of background as to how I began this Ginger's Hope campaign. In 2016, when I was doing some community work, there was a small puppy that I was playing with and it was one of the community dogs and it was kind of playing quite friendly with me, not rough, but, but I had, you know, struck up his face a little bit and, and he was yapping a little quite kindly and suddenly that dog got very violent towards me and it ended up biting and drawing blood in my hand. And because I've been working as a veterinary technician for a while, I had a rabies jab all up to date and I wasn't too worried about it. But about two days later, um, one of the, our community field officers said, oh, you know that puppy that bit you, it died suddenly and the people burned it after it died. So there was no way to know. And I asked about, you know, whether that puppy might have been vaccinated and they kind of laughed at me and say, nobody out here really vaccinates dogs. So I asked, you know, how, how healthy do you think these dogs are? And they said, oh, you know, so many dogs die every year and they have awkward gait and they drool and they have nasal discharge and their physical condition goes down really fast. Some of them vomit and have diarrhea. Some of them are aggressive. And I had also noticed that, you know, I've seen dogs that had skin lesions. Um, next slide. And, and I also began to learn a little bit more about, you know, what is happening with rabies in this country. And I knew that rabies is a deadly virus that is transmitted from the dog saliva. And when it bites, it transmits that virus onto the new host. Um, and once someone's symptoms are shown, there is no treatment. So really the only prevention that you have is rabies vaccination. And across the world, about 90% of human rabies originates from domestic dogs. But through mass vaccination campaigns of 70% of dogs over a five-year period, it's been proven that we can eradicate human rabies. Next. We did some interviews to try to get a better idea of, of how many dogs and cats we had in the area. And we conducted a small set of interviews of about 50, finding out that more than 50% of the dogs were adults, but more than 50% of the cats were kittens. Um, this only represented about 2% of the, the area that we were in. So we, we expanded that sample to look at the fact that there was probably about 1,500 um, dogs and about 500 cats. 
And we set a target of vaccinating a thousand animals in the first year's campaign. We selected about nine sites and we talked to the county and made sure that we had the county support, which at that point we found out that national rabies elimination was actually a target of not just the county government, but the national government next. <coughs> Um, in this group of dogs that we interviewed the first time, we found out that about 15% of the dogs were dying um, annually, and the average age of the dog was only about four years before it died, so that was a, quite a low age for the dogs to be. The dogs died from a variety of illnesses or injuries like snake bites or attacks from other dogs, or possibly that some of them when they thought their dog was too aggressive or for whatever personal reasons might have killed the dogs themselves. We also found out that the deaths of the dogs was randomly distributed. It wasn't just in one area. Um, we also asked if the interviewees reported um, that, um, or if their dogs were vaccinated and 40% of them said that they were. And interestingly, 82% said they received information about rabies and they knew what to do if a person was vaccinated, but they didn't really know that the dog vaccinations is what can also stop the dogs from spreading rabies. Next. We conducted our vaccination, first vaccination campaign in 2017. We were able to hit six of those nine sites with the number of um, vehicles and volunteers that we were able to get in the in the first set. Um, so we were quite excited that we you know, nearly reached our 1000 target um, of 711 dogs and 74 cats. Next. Um, but suddenly a bunch of dogs about six months after the first vaccination campaign started to die. And initially people said the dogs died of rabies or you gave the dog some disease when you when you um, vaccinated our dogs. So we began to have more discussions with people to find out what, what was the symptoms they were having and they were not rabies symptoms. They were distemper sy symptoms. Um, I'm gonna have to hurry because my battery is about to die. Um, the, the county and the Kenya Wildlife Service and Northern Rangelands Trust came and um, did some sample taking and in those samples, um, diagnosed distemper as the reason for the deaths. Next. So we conducted these more interviews um, after this distemper outbreak and did find out that um, at that time, 74% of the people said that their dogs had been vaccinated. Um, similar, but, but actually a more distinct number of adults to puppies. And also, interestingly, there were way more male dogs. So I found out that a lot of people actually killed their female puppies rather than doing sterilizations. Next. We increased our amount of awareness so people got a better understanding of where the rabies and distemper were coming from and what the difference between those diseases were. And in the next slide, you will see that we also conducted another set of interviews with about 250 households and maybe that number of 75% of um, having information or having rabies vaccinations was a little high. So when we spread out a little further from our main base, we didn't have quite as much representation. They still had a very limited knowledge about the cause and the differences between the diseases. Next. We then partnered with a greater group of people and that's when the Ginger's Hope campaign was, was actually named. And it is our hope that other people in Kenya can enjoy their pets as much as we enjoy Ginger, that rabies can be eliminated through joint national efforts and that by adding distemper sterilization and sterilization campaigns, we can also improve overall health and husbandry. Next. Ginger died in 2019, but her name lives on through our Ginger's Hope program. And as scientists, we want to do a lot more than just hope. We want to be able to prove that our campaigns can make a difference in the lives of the animals and the people. And so the Maybai area, oops, back. <laughs> the Maybai area was in the, in the central section here um, of, of the, the conservancies. 
and where we were able to do the vaccination campaign spread out into areas of gaps that were surrounding our Maybai community. So trying to make sure that we're hitting a larger number of, of animals. Next. So this year in 2021. All right, guys. So it looks like Mary got booted off of her Zoom. Um, so I would like to welcome our next presenter, um, Dr. Desmond Tutu. Um, he is currently the veterinary surgeon for TNR Trust, Nairobi, Kenya, a, a charity organization that works to improve human life through animal wel welfare. He organizes mass rabies vaccinations, educations, and spay and neuter clinics. Welcome, Dr. Tutu. Hi, everyone. Uh, did you manage to get the video? Do you want to play it? Yes, we will. I believe we have that, so we'll work on getting that up. So the The video generally will give you an overview of what, what we are doing and uh, what we managed to do on our first year, that's 2019. All right, so uh, you guys can't you hear the video. We, we could not hear the video, no. Right. Let me try one more time. If not, Dr. Desmond Tutu can maybe just explain what was going on. All right.
Yeah, great. So that video just summarizes what we do and uh, how we reach out to communities on, uh, while we are vaccinating dogs and also campaigning on the sterilization, which is a, a very new idea to most Kenyan communities and uh, still admits a lot of resistance. So you want to put up my slides? move to the next okay uh, uh mary had talked more about uh, uh, rabies and also how our dogs live with, in how we live with dogs in our communities so mostly likely i'll not repeat what uh, she has said but uh all of us know that uh, in, in in one out of three homes in kenya there's a dog or a cat with us so that shows you how people love dogs and how they cope with the families and uh, most people feed these dogs, take care of them, but uh, they are unable to provide for them veterinary services. And that's where uh, uh, this kind of uh, activities, the campaigns, they come in to, to bridge that gap that is not there. Uh, the, the owners also use the dogs for, for security and uh, for herding their animals. So uh, rabies is an important uh, zoonotic disease. And also we noticed that it is one of the highest killers uh, uh, of infectious diseases. Uh, uh, worldwide, rabies kills up to 59,000 people per year. That's according to World Health Organization. And in Kenya, it's approximately 2,000 deaths per year. These numbers are highly, highly under, under, under quoted because uh, most deaths are not reported. And also, uh, when people die of, of rabies, uh, the, 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 the situation is confused for other, other, other diseases. Uh, when a patient is presented to the hospital with, uh, with rabies, if they don't give any history of dog bite, uh, the doctors will run away from the condition and treat for other things. Mostly they treat for cerebral malaria or they treat for meningitis. Or in certain situations, the person is not even taken to hospital. They believe it's uh, witchcraft. So that makes this statistic uh, miss so many numbers and we say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very low. So uh, spay and neuter is a, is, a, is, a new, is, is a new idea that we are, we are bringing in to control the population, uh, given by the fact that uh, dogs can give up to 3,000 offsprings in their lineage in a year, and cats can do up to 20,000. So with the mass vaccination, if you don't spay and neuter, by the time you're coming back next year, uh, these numbers are, 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 uh, are overwhelming. And you realize that if, if you don't do spay and neuter, uh, your vaccination that you did last year uh, will be nullified by the new numbers of puppies and kittens that uh, will have come up in, the, in that one year. So that's why we're introducing this uh, idea. Uh, good thing that in the last two years, it's, it's, uh, it's picking up and uh, more people are embracing it. And uh, we are happy that most vets are willing to volunteer their time and come up and, and, and help with the, with the surgeries. Uh, something else about uh, rabies is that uh, education and the sensitization in our community, communities is the, is the main, main, main way of achieving uh, what we want by, by uh, uh, while targeting the 70% of vaccination. If uh, children are educated and they grow up with the idea that dogs need to be vaccinated every year, we are looking at the next generation who know that when they have a pet, a dog or a cat, it must be vaccinated to stay with you at home. Uh, Again, they know that when you're bitten by a dog, you need to go to the hospital, you need to get uh, what number of vaccines, and also you need to report that you've been bitten by a dog, vaccinated or, or not vaccinated, you need to go to the hospital, get your uh, rabies vaccination. So that is our target, because it's easier to explain it to adults who also uh, quickly forget about the situation and ignore, but the children, when you put this thing into action, the way you've seen in the video how we educate them, they are growing up with this knowledge and we are sure it will make a difference in the next year. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, Kana and Distempa uh, present a, a different situation in that it is uh, ignored by, 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 by most uh, of these campaigns. Uh, 
most of the dogs that come down with the canine distemper uh, probably are not diagnosed, especially the ones in the communities. They're not diagnosed because sometimes symptoms are not very, very overt like rabies. So most campaigns, uh, they don't include the canine distemper. But if you look at the communities that live in the borderline of wildlife, this campaign has now been incorporated in that when rabies vaccination is done, uh, canine distemper is also done at the same time. And it's picking up. And uh, I think the government now almost insists that when you're doing this kind of campaign, you need to include the canine distemper to protect the domestic dog and also the, the wild canines. So it's been proven that the vaccination is improving the situation as uh, more wild dogs are, are now coming up. And uh, I think in a few years back, there was an out. They didn't see them. Next slide. So the situation in Kenya is, uh, is, a, is very, very, very concerning in that uh, is, rabies is still one of the killer diseases uh, in our communities. Uh, the most affected areas are Siaya County, Makueni, Machakos, uh, Baringo, and Moranga. But even in Nairobi, as we speak now, uh, two weeks ago, there was a case of rabies. So it is uh, everywhere. Nairobi people vaccinate their dogs, people take care of their dogs, but we still see cases of rabies in stray dogs that are uh, slowly overwhelming the city. So with the campaigns and also with the, with the, with the, with the regular vaccinations, that's the only way we are going to, 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 to finish up this disease. Uh, like I mentioned, the reason why these deaths are not recorded is uh, because uh, history are not taken. Uh, children, when they are beaten, they don't report to their parents. They don't say, I was beaten by a dog on our way, because they go to school, they provoke these dogs until one of them is beaten. That's when they know the dog is dangerous. Again, they hide the situation from, from their parents. By the time they are reporting that they have a wound, they were beaten by a dog, I, the, 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 the disease is gone. By, the, by that time, they're already showing symptoms. Sometimes they don't even mention about the dog bite. They just show an injury. So they're taken to the hospital, the, 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 the disease is not, not recorded, and also, Eventually, when they die, that statistic is, is, is missed. And uh, another thing is that bite back victims hardly get the vaccine. When you go to a Kenyan hospital uh, with a dog bite, they'll give you uh, an anti tetanus vaccine instead of rabies. Uh, reason being, most hospitals don't stock this vaccine. Number two is that uh, at one time, uh, maybe when the, the doctors are on attachment or internship, and the, the main doctor gave tetanus. So these doctors grow with that in their mind that a bite victim only need tetanus, they don't need rabies. And uh, government hospitals also don't stock this uh, anti-rabies. Anti so that's part of our education that we've incorporated with the counties that uh, when we, whenever we go out, we meet the county director of veterinary services and we also meet the county public health team and insist that every hospital need to have the rabies vaccine and it need to be put into use that when people are bitten, they are able to get this vaccine, the full doses, whether the dog is vaccinated or not. Uh, next slide. So uh, how is TNR coming into the situation? So TNR is a, is a charity organization it, that was formed in uh, 2015. And all this time they've been uh, just working uh, low grade until in 2017, when, uh, 2019, when uh, we got a full vet and we got a mobile clinic and we got license from the veterinary board to, to run the, the charity work that we have been doing. So our main, our main business is to have a healthy population and also uh, healthy uh, pet life. That's dogs and cats that are vaccinated and are also sterilized, to maintain a, a good population that the owners can take care of and also to educate the masses on the importance of rabies in our community and animal welfare. So that's what basically TNR uh, Trust is doing. And in that, we have uh, incorporated the campaigns because we realized that the government had neglected uh, this campaign. It was only done once during the World Rabies Day. And uh, sometimes they take four to five years or even 10 years before they go back to some place where they did vaccination. And even if they do the mass vaccination, it's 200 or 300 dogs, which actually doesn't impact anything. So uh, TNR will come up and we are creating this model to, to, to counties and also to governments so that they can emulate what we are doing and uh, help further the campaign. Uh, next slide. 
in 2019 and uh, 2018, these are the numbers that we managed to do. You can see they are, they are, they are, they are great numbers and uh, we were just starting. And uh, last year in the middle of the pandemic, we only managed to do uh, four campaigns, which two are not full campaign. Our full campaign is when we incorporate vaccination and also sterilization and education. But uh, last year we were not able to do uh, sterilization because people crowd and people wait as the animals are, are, are recovering. So gathering was not part of it. And also education, uh, we, we could not do it. But we still managed to do some vaccination and achieve some good numbers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so part of what we do is uh, uh, rescuing dogs, because in, in, in our line of duty, we meet so many animals that are distressed. The case, for example, whatever the, the dog we are seeing on the, on the, on the picture, was hit by a car in Kibra and stayed with that broke, uh, fractured limb for four months. And in the middle of all that injury, she got pregnant and had those puppies. So when she had the puppies is when we were called to go and help. Uh, we took her in, sterilized and also amputated. And now it's in a very happy home, uh, away from the streets and all our puppies have also been rehomed. Uh, we, we, we meet a lot of dogs that have been hit by cars. Some have been ne neglected. Like last year when people were moving out, people were just dumping their dogs. So that's part of the work that we do in promoting healthy community. Next slide. Uh, so very quickly in our achievements, I think I've mentioned the first two. So the in-house surgeries is uh, targeting the low income areas, what is commonly called in Kenya, the slum areas. We have uh, people who help us uh, promote the campaign in these uh, societies and people book in and bring in their animals for sterilization. It's gaining momentum and these days we can even have uh, 15 to 20 bookings in a week and it's really helping the situation. Uh, more cuts have been done through this uh, process and uh, the estates are appreciating what we are doing in promoting uh, rabies vaccination and also sterilization. So uh, in, we, in partnership with the SEK in Samburu, we, 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 we managed to do only one campaign. We were planning to do uh, more last year, but we could not. So this year we are going back there for more time and uh, we'll do more work uh, with the SEK and uh, the, the, the campaign is gaining popularity. The feedback uh, they are getting is much, much better where that uh, the dogs that were done last year are looking more healthy and owners are more happy. So people are already embracing the spay neuter as a part of the rabies vaccination, rabies uh, and distemper vaccination campaign. So they were located more days uh, for the surgeries and more stations for the surgery for this year, which is a, a good thing telling you that uh, the campaign is gaining momentum. Uh, we are looking forward to successful uh, campaigns in May. And uh, if that goes through and we do more animals, more people are going to be happy. And I think the culture that May, Mary mentioned that uh, uh, the people uh, drown or kill uh, female uh, dogs or puppies is slowly going to stop because now they know that uh, they can keep the females uh, and the, the, in the next year there's a campaign that is coming up and their females are spayed and are recovering and living more healthy with them and they don't get more puppies that they can't take care of. Next slide. So this is a scenario uh, just similar to what we did in Samburu. I just couldn't get a, a, a good picture for, uh, from what we did in Samburu. But you can see we have uh, makeshift theaters where we, we quickly uh, clean up an area, uh, use uh, school tables and desks, and uh, do the operation. And uh, this uh, activity, despite being done in the, in the field, is uh, the success rate is higher. It actually is higher than in, in I've worked in a very busy clinic. And sometimes in clinics, we see more reaction. But the, 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 the village dogs, I think they're just hardy or resistant or, or, or very good. Out of the 600 to 700 surgeries that we died, we've done in the field, I, I can assure you that the reactions that we have seen are less than 20 dogs. So that's, that tells you the success rate is very high. And that gives you the motivation that people are happy that their dogs are operated and they're healing well and uh, they're in a short time, they are back and going on with their lives. Like in Samburu, when we were doing follow-up, uh, just a day after the surgery, all the dogs had gone to the field with the cows. No dog was locked up uh, that is down or showing signs of pain or anything. The dogs were going on with their business as usual. And that was what gives the community the courage to, 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 to embrace this surgery and, uh, and uh, reduce the population of the dogs that they keep. Uh, next slide. So uh, 
the main challenges we face uh, as a team, uh, probably also with the SEK facing the same challenges, is need, need for permanent source of funds that will facilitate this kind of activity. Uh, SEK mobilizes uh, vets from Nairobi. Uh, these vets are already practicing, so for them to leave their practice and come and do this kind of volunteer work is a big challenge. For you to get experienced vets, uh, definitely they are running their clinics and uh, they are the ones who can do surgery. So for you to get them for that period of time, five days or one week to leave their practice and come and do this kind of charity work, uh, it takes the, 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 our association, the case cover, uh, Kenya Small and Companion Animal uh, uh, Veterinary Association to mobilize these vets and talk to them and uh, make them spare their time to come and do this kind of charity work. Uh, this kind of vaccination is a huge cost implication that needs an assurance that there is enough money for us to do it this year and are going to do it next year and the year after. So that's why, uh, that's why the, the that's why the need, there's need for permanent source of fund. Another time thing is lack of support from the government. The government is the one that is supposed to be doing this sensitization and also doing this kind of uh, activities, but they are not doing it. If uh, you go to a county government that you want to do this kind of work, the government itself wants you to pay them to do this kind of work. Mary even mentioned that the county government vets have to be paid to participate in this kind of exercise. They ask for their per diem. If it is not there, you never see them. When they show up, they come like visitors, uh, bystanders. They stand and just watch what we're doing. They don't participate. So that's a very, very big uh, challenge to, uh, to us. If the county government don't accept what you want to do, maybe because you can't pay, then they stop your activity. They say, leave it to us, we'll take care of it, but they never do it. So that's a very big stumbling block in this kind of campaign. Another thing is uh, we have to rely on external sources of funds. Sometimes that the government, uh, the NGO council uh, uh, comes in and regulate who should donate to you, who should, uh, how, how you manage your, uh, your resources they want to see. And in the event they bring in corruption and they want tip-offs, they want to be paid for certain funds to come in. And that has made uh, so many people who are doing this kind of charity work to stick to individual level. They just do it as an individual, uh, look for an organization that is already established to, to partner with because they can't uh, register an NGO and run it successfully and do this kind of work. So that's a big challenge. The other challenge that is not mentioned here is uh, acceptability. We have had so many resistance, like uh, when Mary mentioned that uh, six dogs died uh, after the vaccination. Next year you go to such kind of a, an area if you don't do proper education or proper sensitization before you do the, uh, the, the, the campaign, people don't accept because they think you came to kill their dogs. They still have the belief that the government used to kill dogs using strychnine. Uh, they never vaccinated. So wherever there was complaint of overpopulation, the government would uh, quickly move in, bait dogs and uh, kill and collect the carcasses, go and dump. This was very traumatic to the local people. So anytime you go in with an idea that we want to carry out campaign, we want to vaccinate dogs, we want to sterilize and do surgery, they quickly reject it. You take time, uh, do barazas with the chiefs and also with the local authority to convince these people. You go in with the public address again to announce before they can actually accept that come in and do the vaccination. So it's still a big challenge because you look at the areas covered by the existing organizations, it's a... Uh, they are very, very small areas, but it's a good thing that these campaigns are gaining popularity and people are quickly accepting them. And we are happy that even with the small strides that we are making, we are moving somewhere. Next slide. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, that's a happy uh, community in Maybe after a successful campaign last year. Thank you. Thank you so much. What amazing work you do. Thank you so much for being here. I know it is um, very, very early for you, but we do appreciate your time. If you guys have any questions uh, for Dr. Tutu, you can um, put them in the chat. Uh, just let me know who uh, the questions are going to. Um, all righty. Our next presenter um, will be uh, Dr. Susie Garrity. Um, uh, 
Uh, Susie Garrity uh, is a veterinarian with the San Diego Humane Society and will share a little bit about the status of rabies in the US and why vaccination um, campaigns are vital importance. Um, so welcome, Dr. Garrity. Thank you. Um, that was awesome, Dr. Tutu. It was great to hear all the work that you're doing um, in Kenya. And as a shelter vet, I um, share some of your um, struggles with the TNR um, and getting people to accept. So um, I definitely appreciate all the work you're doing um, across the globe. So um, yeah, uh, if we can go ahead and put up my uh, slides, that would be great. All right, so my presentation is geared more towards uh, why vaccinate and the vaccine specifically, kind of looking at, you know, which vaccines um, are considered core vaccines, how quickly do they work, who should get the vaccine, um, and uh, kind of touching a little bit on distemper and rabies, some of the diseases that you've already heard about, um, but more geared towards the vaccines themselves. And go ahead and go to the next slide. So just a little bit about me, um, just as um, I was introduced by Jessica, um, I've been a vet for about eight years now. Um, before I was a veterinarian, I actually was a wildlife biologist. Um, so I worked with a lot of exotic species, um, which conveniently prepared me for um, work as a veterinarian since we do see pretty much um, all types of different species. Um, I did work mostly in emergency and general practice for the first five years. Um, in the last about two and a half years, I transitioned over to shelter medicine. So more from kind of an individual um, animal to more of population medicine, which um, in its own is a very, very different way to look at um, veterinary medicine and animal care. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the importance of immunity and vaccination. So it can prevent diseases that are oftentimes fatal. The ones that um, you know we see mostly in domestic dogs and cats include rabies, which affects um, pretty much all mammals, um, canine distemper, which we'll see mostly in our dog population, canine parvovirus um, in our dog population, as well as feline panleukopenia. Um, and that's basically the cat version of, of parvovirus. Um, vaccinations is interesting. So, um, you know, vaccinating one individual animal does have a great effect, but the goal of vaccination is to achieve um, immunity, not only in the animal, but also in the community or the herd. The best way to kind of uh, picture this, um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably been hearing a lot about herd immunity over the past year with the pandemic, um, especially with as the COVID vaccines are rolling out. But if you look at this picture on the bottom, if you kind of look at the cows um, in the red, those are the unvaccinated um, animals in the population. And so if you look at the image on the right, you can see that when about 70% of the animals are um, vaccinated, those red ones that may be carrying the viruses or carrying the diseases, they don't really get super close to the other animals that um, are other animals that are unvaccinated. However, if you look to the picture on the left, the more we increase the amount in the population that's vaccinated, so on the left we see 95% vaccinated, the chances of those few that are unvaccinated to cross paths decreases significantly and that's how we get herd immunity. And so what that means, um, and I think Dr. Tutu was saying how we, you know, the goal was to try and get at least 70% vaccinated. You can see a dramatic decrease um, in a lot of these deadly viruses just by vaccinating a large part of the herd or the community, and not every single animal, which of course would be ideal, but not always possible. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So I put this in here because, um, you know, with the pandemic, um, it gives a, a really good kind of image as in a human perspective of just looking at that top picture, you know, the blue is the, you know, not immunized 
the yellow is those that have been um, immunized, um, and then the red is the sick and contagious. So in that first graph, you can see pretty much if you're not immune to a virus, that will spread very, very quickly within a population. And that's what we saw you know, here um, throughout the world with COVID this time last year. But as we start to go down that, um, that kind of pyramid that we see, you can see that the more people that are vaccinated, the more people that have immunity and are healthy, it kind of decreases those that are contagious and makes it harder for that disease or that virus to transmit. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. So there's three different um, statuses that animals or even people can have when you think about the immune status um, once they get vaccinated or they don't get vaccinated. So one is, you know, we think about, you know, the, the puppies or the kittens. So they are just been born. They pretty much don't have much immunity at all to anything and they're very susceptible to infection. So they have a naive immune system. Um, the second is those that either have contracted the disease and their body fought it off and they develop natural immunity um, or those that have been vaccinated. So that falls into that second category. And the third category is those that have been affected and are either showing signs, have the virus or shedding the virus. So every person, every animal, when a disease is presented to them will fall into one of these three categories. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So what makes, you know, how um, efficacious is a vaccine? So natural exposure usually will give you um, better immunity than say a vaccine. So in cases like canine distemper, canine parvovirus, or feline panleukopenia, if the animals get those vaccines as puppies or kittens, oftentimes without a vaccine, they will have lifelong immunity. But for those that don't have exposure to um, these viruses, um, then they do need vaccines, and those vaccines will oftentimes need to be boosted um, throughout their lifetime in order for them to maintain immunity. Um, there's some other um, pathogens that we'll see in both our dog and cat population, and those are the three that I listed on the bottom there. Um, if animals, you know, get the first one, Bordetella, that's kennel cough, or if cats get herpes virus or Khaleesi virus, um, they will not get lifelong immunity like distemper, parvo, or panleukopenia. So each virus does have a little bit of difference. Next slide, please. So who should be vaccinated? So there's, you know, tons of questions. How young should you vaccinate? Um, should you vaccinate a sick animal or an injured animal? Should you vaccinate a pregnant animal? Should you vaccinate a nursing animal? And the answer is yes, they all should be vaccinated. So you always want to look at the risk of the environment that they're in. So with puppies and kittens, we'll get into it a little bit later of when to vaccinate puppies and kittens and how often um, to vaccinate puppies and kittens, but the sick and the injured animals is usually a question that we'll see a lot. So oftentimes if an animal is sick, their immune system may not be as strong. And so the worry is if we vaccinate an animal who is sick and they're not going to have as good of an immune response, are we just wasting the vaccine? Should we even vaccinate them? But if they're in a population where we know, say, distemper is very prevalent, say we know that rabies is very prevalent or feline panleukopenia, then yes, the benefit of vaccinating them at the very minimal chance that that vaccine will give them some immunity is absolutely worth it. Um, you know, lots of studies have been done that even when animals are sick or injured, a vaccine oftentimes won't change the course of their prognosis. And so vaccinating them, you know, especially if they're in a wild population or in a shelter population, um, could very well save them from exposure to a potentially fatal disease. Um, as far as the pregnant and nursing animals, um, yes, absolutely, we will vaccinate them, no problem, no hesitation, because um, sometimes um, we can get a little bit of passive immunity, um, either in the milk or if the mom was pregnant, um, she might be able to pass on some of her uh, maternal antibodies onto her little babies. Next slide, please. So there is always the risk of adverse reactions. Um, 
you know, nothing comes without risk, but it always comes down to a risk versus benefits. In general, vaccines are very safe and the reactions we see are often mild. So in puppies and kittens, they might be tired for a little bit. They might be stiff or sore in the limb that they got vaccinated in, but oftentimes you won't notice the puppies and the kittens will be bouncing off the wall. You won't notice any difference in them. Um, there is a small subset of population that will have more severe reactions to the vaccines. Um, some, um, sometimes they can develop masses or tumors. Um, they can have a very adverse reaction, an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine and need um, immediate treatment. Um, autoimmune diseases is thought to potentially be um, a factor um, in death. So if it goes untreated with anaphylaxis, it can potentially lead to death. But um, having worked, you know, in emergency prior to coming to shelter, um, a lot of those signs will start with, say, a little bit of vomiting, um, maybe falling over or weakness. And if they're brought in um, to a clinic and are given treatment, usually, you know, most of them will do just fine and survive. Um, working in the shelter now, we vaccinate, we vaccinate um, I think annually, we take in tens of thousands of animals every year. Um, and I don't, you know, to my knowledge, I've been here two and a half years, I've never lost an animal to vaccines. Next slide, perfect. So what are the core vaccines for a dog? So the core vaccines that we think about um, is distemper, of course. Um, so distemper virus vaccine actually is one of the most effective vaccines of any species. What's remarkable about it is that usually within minutes to hours of giving the vaccination, a single vaccination um, with the MLV's um, modified live virus or recombinant vaccine, we can actually see some signs of immunity. And by two to three days post-vaccination, um, we can often see prevention and transmissions of really severe signs of the disease, which is phenomenal, especially um, in animals that are susceptible um, to distemper um, virus. Um, parvovirus is another one of those that can be fatal um, as well, not if left untreated. Um, and within three days after getting the vaccine, oftentimes we'll see immunity. Um, older dogs tend to have a stronger response. And so the older dogs tend to do pretty good very quickly after the vaccine. Puppies, unfortunately, you know, if they've only gotten the vaccines a few days ago and are exposed to parvo, we can still see them become sick and ill. But, um, you know, as we go on um, and puppies get a little bit older, um, and they've had the vaccine on board for say a week or two weeks, oftentimes that vaccine can provide them very significant immunity to parvovirus. Um, so these three, um, and the last one is, is not quite um, something that we see quite as often, but oftentimes distemper, parvovirus, and adenovirus, all of that comes together in a single shot, a single vaccine, um, and it's given um, in, in, depending if you're a puppy or an adult dog in a certain um, series. Next slide. So I threw in here um, a little bit about cats. I know it's specifically based um, kind of like our dogs tonight, um, but I do know that the campaign will also take care of cats. So the um, main vaccine, the FVRCP, kind of includes these three viruses. The first one, feline panleukopenia virus vaccine, is actually probably one of the most fatal and devastating viruses that cats will see. Um, and they are very well protected with a vaccine, um, which also takes on effect very rapidly within about three days and oftentimes will have very long lasting immunity with the vaccine. Um, and we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. So rabies as um, been discussed, Dr. D Dr. Tutu had mentioned earlier, is something that, you know, we will vaccinate both our dogs and cats with um, in our domestic population. Um, rabies um, is a zoonotic disease, so it can be transmitted um, to any mammal and to humans. Um, for the rabies vaccine, so vaccines are composed of, you know, either killed virus um, or um, a modified live virus or recombinant virus. Those are some of the names you might hear and you maybe have um, heard in the past. And so rabies is a little bit different in that it's usually, um, at least here in the United States, given as a killed um, 
virus. And so that takes a little bit longer to develop immunity. So that usually takes about two to three weeks after vaccination to develop immunity. Um, but what's awesome is that the vaccine itself can last for um, usually up to about three years with one vaccine. Um, rabies vaccines, because rabies is such a fatal disease and affects humans, it must be delivered um, in the United States under the direct or indirect supervision of a veterinarian, and that is by law. Um, so if a veterinarian is on site, um, we cannot administer a vaccination um, of rabies, and every rabies that is administered will be associated with a veterinarian's name. Um, so with rabies vaccines, usually what will happen, um, you know, we don't, we give them about 12 weeks of age and our, our cats and dogs, that's the youngest that will give it. And as long as they get one other dose of the vaccine, anywhere between three weeks and one years after that first vaccine, that actually provides quite amazing immunity against rabies. So very few animals that have been given at least two vaccines of rabies will develop rabies if they um, come in contact with the virus. However, what's interesting to note is that if they've only received one dose of the rabies vaccine, um, then oftentimes those animals will be susceptible to rabies. So one dose is, is definitely not enough. Um, I have seen instances um, in practice, um, in my own cat actually, I tried to bring her to a rabies rabies free island um, and she had had two vaccines and her rabies titer was not high enough. So there's always, you know, there's some animals in the population that won't develop a strong enough immune system. Um, on the other hand, I also had to get rabies vaccinated um, when I first started working with animals well over 10 years ago um, and I checked my titers every two years um, and off of the three vaccines I received initially, I still have titers um, protective for rabies. So. Um, okay, next slide. So when to vaccinate? So this is a very um, interesting question and it goes back and forth a lot, but this graph is a great graph because it shows um, pretty much, you know, that that area where it's kind of like the gray zone. So that blue line that's coming from the left and going down to the right, that's the maternal antibody level. So when a little baby kitten or puppy is born, they have really high levels from mom. So that milk that they get from mom within that first few days is called colostrum. Um, and that colostrum is just full of really good stuff um, as far as protective antibodies against a lot of diseases that mom has potentially come in contact with or been vaccinated against, and she's able to transfer that over to her babies. As time goes on, and you can see that bottom line of the age of the pet, we start to see this green line that kind of goes and crosses it. So right about eight weeks is kind of that, that level where they're actually not protected. So usually about like six to 10 weeks. Um, and that's why oftentimes we'll say, you know, don't let your dog, your puppies play with each other or kittens play with each other because there's a period where mom is no longer protecting them and their vaccines are not taking effect yet. Um, and so oftentimes what we'll do is we'll start vaccinating them about six weeks of age and then every four weeks we'll vaccinate them after that. So usually at like six weeks, 12 weeks, and then at 16 weeks because we want to hit right on that right end of the curve, right? When mom's antibodies have gone down and they have a full immune system. And that way we know that their body will take that vaccine um, and give them protective levels um, of antibodies for what we're vaccinating for. Okay, next slide. So canine distemper. So one of the main vaccines that um, we are um, definitely, you know, is a core vaccine for dogs. Um, it's viral disease, highly contagious. It is worldwide and is one of the major killers of dogs. Um, the, since the vaccine was developed, um, it's been less common in the United States to, since 1970s, um, but it's still seen throughout the world. Um, it's mostly um, a virus that we associate with dogs, um, dogs, foxes, um, but it's also seen a lot in the wildlife population as Dr. Tutu had, was describing as well. So, um, you know, the ferrets, skunks, raccoons, is what we see over here in the United States, but there have been documented cases also in, in big cats as well. So um, they will actually get the vaccine that we will often give to ferrets um, is the vaccine that will, it's a recombinant vaccine that we'll give to, to large cats. Um, clinical signs for these dogs, they should have some pictures here is 
is you'll see diarrhea, vomiting, um, so you'll see GI signs, but it's also associated with the respiratory tract. So we're also going to see really thick discharge around the eyes, could be discharge around the eyes, we'll see a cough, we'll see nasal discharge as well, and as the virus progresses, we will see it actually go um, and cause seizures or twitches. Sometimes we describe it as fly biting, you'll see a dog kind of just like biting in the air. Um, if you see respiratory and gastrointestinal signs, distemper is usually something that's pretty high on our list. Um, and this is spread either direct contact um, with animal to animal or also indirect contact with aerosols, um, shared bedding, shared water dishes, um, things like that. So with any virus, so just like canine distemper, there is no specific treatment. So treatment is often supportive care. So if they're vomiting or having diarrhea, we're gonna support them with fluids to keep them hydrated. Um, you know, if they're sneezing or develop pneumonia, we'll put them on antibiotics, but there's no actual specific treatment for distemper, which is what makes it so fatal. If animals survive this, um, oftentimes they are left with signs um, that they've experienced this virus. Um, and you can see on the paw pad, you'll see kind of that thickened skin, we call it hyper, um, hyperkeratosis of the paw pads. And you can see on the top right image, there's a little bit of that defect on the tooth, we call it enamel defect. And, and if we see this, we know that this dog probably has um, natural immunity. It's probably been exposed to distemper and was able to develop immunity um, for distemper. Um, this is um, a completely preventable disease um, and the vaccine is up to 99% effective. Um, canine parvovirus um, is part of that vaccine group as well with the distemper. It's also a contagious disease. This one is mostly associated with the um, gastrointestinal tract. It's a newer virus, actually. It's um, appeared in dogs in the 1970s, late 1970s, um, but it has a rapid spread throughout the population. Um, it's oftentimes associated with the dog population, so coyotes, foxes, wolves, um, but we also see in the wildlife population as well, so raccoons, minks. Um, and this is also direct and indirect spread. So either they're, you know, in contact with the feces um, or shared bedding, shared water bowls, um, anywhere where they can get in contact with um, the viral particles. Again, it is a virus. There is no specific treatment. Treatment is supportive care. So we're usually hydrating them, antibiotics as needed, nutritional support, um, and just hoping that these little guys are strong enough to fight it off. Um, most dogs can recover with aggressive treatment, but if we don't see animals turning the corner around three or four days, um, then usually that's associated with a poor prognosis. Um, this is also a very preventable virus in dogs, um, and vaccines are very, very effective. Um, just briefly, this is probably, as I was describing, um, the, the, the most kind of um, brutal disease that we'll see in the feline population. And actually, um, I was reading an article in a paper of a captive bred population of cheetahs that actually developed fan, feline panleukopenia as well. So protecting our um, you know, domestic or feral cats are, is definitely important. It's also a viral disease. Um, uh, messed up the how common is it from the last slide, but this can be seen in domestic um, as well as large cats. Um, and it's it's pretty much the equivalent to dog parvovirus. So you're gonna see the same signs, you're gonna see the same transmission, usually through feces, usually you're gonna see the bloody diarrhea, the vomiting, the dehydration, um, and of course, especially in small kittens, sometimes sudden death, unfortunately. Again, there's no specific treatment. Um, prognosis varies very greatly. Um, this is one of the most devastating diseases. As I mentioned, it can wipe out an entire population of cats and we've seen it do it throughout the world. Um, death rate sometimes is almost 100% in a cat population. Um, age and severity of diseases is inversely proportional. So little kittens are more likely to succumb to the disease than um, older animals. Um, if we are able to do prompt and aggressive therapy, the death rate drops down to 30 to 50%. Um, and fortunately, we've been able here in San Diego to treat a lot of these kittens with um, the panleukopenia virus. And I would say that we're, our, 
we, our survival rate is probably closer to 70%, um, but that is with very aggressive treatment. Um, again, it is preventable, um, and that vaccine is, is really effective and does have um, quite a long effect on the population as well. Uh, rabies, which has been mentioned already um, in this um, talk tonight, is one of the most devastating viral diseases affecting mammals. Um, it affects um, the brain and spinal cord through inflammation. And so we'll either see it present as a very furious form where you're going to see, you know, the foaming at the mouth or you're going to see animals getting aggressive all of a sudden. Um, and 20% of human cases you'll see in more of like a paralytic form. So we call it sometimes the dumb form of rabies where you know, the person or the animal just kind of shuts down. It's not as common as the furious, but it shouldn't be discounted. Um, if you see an animal that's maybe not acting furious, but more paralyzed and not responsive, that animal could still have rabies. Um, in the U.S., we had about 400 to 500 domestic pet cases a year compared to only two in humans. I was actually reading an interesting study um, in the United States between 1960 and 2008. 18, there were 89 cases um, of human rabies. Um, a large portion of that is actually, so 36 of the 125 cases were attributed to dog bites from international travel, um, but 62 out of that 125 were actually not dog bites. Um, it was actually attributed to bats. So in the United States, because of the mass rabies vaccination, um, we don't typically see rabies associated with dog bites. Here we see it associated with um, the bite or the scratch um, from a bat. Um, and so it's very awesome to see that um, vaccination has done a really good job um, in the United States at decreasing um, the, the, the death. Um, but um, as mentioned before, the death rates over 150 countries is about 59,000 every year. 95% um, of those cases occur in Africa and Asia, and 50% of those cases occur in children less than 15 years old, often, um, you know, probably trying to go um, pet or interact with, you know, a sweet little dog or a sweet little puppy. Um, all mammals are susceptible, includes humans, um, and kind of as we discussed, we can see, you know, fever, pain, tingling, prickling, abnormal behavior, um, salivating from the mouth, sometimes they're very afraid of water, um, sometimes they're afraid of like air, um, and then of course any, any signs of death um, after any of these episodes, rabies is very high on the list. So this is um, a nice chart that I found kind of based off of that study that shows when the mass vaccination of dogs against rabies started in 1947 here in the United States. And you can see that dramatic drop um, that we see both in domestic animals as well as human cases. Um, and the majority, which we're seeing throughout the rest of the world, is the wildlife population will have rabies. They'll come in contact with one of our you know, family dogs or, or even cats. Um, and then they will then bite one of our our human family members, and that is how we'll get rabies into, um, you know, the human population. Um, dog bites happen to attribute to 99% of the spread of rabies. Um, once bitten, it can take one week to one year for it to manifest, usually two to three months. Um, here in San Diego, if we have a cat or dog that's attacked by a coyote and we don't know its vaccine status, we will quarantine that animal for six months um, before we will allow it to be adopted due to the risk of rabies. Um, treatment, again, is supportive, but one of the largest things that we've seen to have effect is to vigorously wash and flush out the wound to decrease the viral load from the bite or the scratch. Um, and then, of course, if you, you know, post-exposure prophylaxis and vaccination um, is, is definitely life-saving. Um, it's often um, fatal, but if, we, if there's survival, sometimes there's long-lasting nervous system damage. Um, it is 100% preventable with vaccine. Um, and besides vaccinations, the, you know, both in humans and in animals, um, you know, dog bite prevention strategies, educating, um, you know, just like Dr. Tutu was mentioning that um, his campaign was doing, educating children of dog behavior, you know, when to approach an animal, when to not approach an animal, can definitely lead to decreasing um, the rabies um, as a zoonotic disease to humans. 
The World Health Organization has a goal of zero deaths by rabies in 2030. And so I think there's a huge push throughout the world to try and um, vaccinate humans, vaccinate animals, um, and to learn ways to interact with dogs to potentially avoid the bites because um, one death every nine minutes worldwide is attributed to rabies. And it's it's just so heartbreaking because it is 100% preventable if we can get the education out there, if we can get the resources to start vaccinating. I just wanna say thank you for letting me be a part of your um, canine and cocktails tonight. Thank you so much. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, all right, so we're a little behind on our schedule. So we're gonna go ahead and um, skip our break time. So uh, if you need to refill your drink or use the restroom, um, go ahead and do so now before our next uh, presenter. Um, I do not see any questions thus far in the comments, but um, we have about 45 minutes left of our presentation. So feel free to add those um, as the other presenters um, go ahead. All righty. Let's see who we have next. Megan, are you are you here now? Are you here yet? Let's see. I do not see her in yet. So let's go ahead and um, Mary, would you like to get on and introduce uh, Cosmos and Paul? Yeah, um, I can try to turn my video on a minute so I can do the introduction. So um, like I said in my presentation, um, we do use dogs in as a conservation role. Um, Cosmos Wambua is our assistant director and has been um, working with Action for Cheetahs in Kenya as one of the founders of our program. Um, he holds a, a bachelor's degree from um, oh goodness, Cosmos, you're going to end up having to say where your degrees are from because I've forgotten. He has a bachelor's and a master's degree. The master's degree is from Addis Ababa um, and the, the undergraduate degree is actually from India. Um, and he is the supervisor, not just of the dog program, but of a lot of other general programs. And then Paul has been working with us for just a little under a year so far, but he came to us with a lot of experience. Um, Paul McKibia, um, not only has experience, but he's also received an award in Kenya um, because he was a part of the team that was used with dogs to try to solve um, the the issue of one of the um, one of the terrorist attacks that happened in Kenya a few years ago. And so I'm just going to pass it over to these guys, and they're going to go ahead and start with their presentation. So Jess, if you would like to spotlight um, Cosmos and or Paul, Cosmos will start it out giving a background of um, the project and then Paul will talk more about the dogs and how the dogs are used. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mary. That's very flattering that uh, you can't remember where my degrees come from, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's uh, um, I'm actually quite happy with uh, all the presentations that have been given so far. Um, and yeah, um, as ecologists, we are also not averse to um, the companionship of dogs. And uh, you know, getting our little brains working on how else we can use uh, dogs for conservation purposes. So yeah, if you can go ahead and put uh, put up slides, I will uh, get into it. It uh, daybreak is beginning. So yes, uh, as Mary mentioned, my name is Cosmas Wambua, um, and I'm an ecologist um, with Action for Cheetahs in Kenya. 
And uh, over time, you know, after uh, Ginger came uh, into our lives, I would say our lives, because uh, I also spend a lot of time with Ginger. Um, we we really came to appreciate uh, uh, the use of dogs after uh, participating in a workshop in Tanzania where detection dogs were uh, were presented uh, as a mod or as a means of uh, doing uh, surveys. Um, and over time, you know, we've we've seen we had seen dogs used in 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 the uh, field of uh, drug uh, enforcement. Uh, and police work. Uh, so basically, uh, moving on into the the areas of of uh, wildlife surveys using dogs um, as an indirect uh, means of uh, you know uh, studying cryptic uh, species was was quite an eye opener. Next slide, please. So in. Uh, 2007, we completed our first uh, nationwide survey, um, basically looking at the historical and present uh, cheetah ranges just from presence data. Uh, and we found that still 75% of uh, Kenya's uh, cheetah historical range still supported cheetahs. However, uh, there were issues to do with connectivity and uh, also the difficulties of studying cheetahs outside of protected areas. Uh, were making us question the 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 more uh, the more uh, common methods that were used to uh, study cheetahs. Next slide, please. <laughs> so yeah, after the Tanzanian. Uh, uh, after participating in the Tanzanian meeting uh, in 2008 up to 2010, uh, we tried to train Ginger. Um, she was a very, very uh, smart dog. Uh, and, you know, we tried to train her uh, to see if, uh, if she could work out as a, as a sniffer dog. Uh, but then uh, Ginger was more of a pet and did not have all the qualities that needed uh, she was still a very playful dog, uh, grown up as a, as a pet and not as a working dog. Um, and so in 2012, we were lucky enough to, uh, to get a dog donated from Tanzania, uh, which was called Mara. And uh, um, uh, Diana worked with Mara, uh, training her uh, to find cheetah poops. But unfortunately, uh, Mara had uh, an accident and broke her back and she had to be put down um, and this was was quite uh, quite a hard period for both Diana uh, who had grown to who had grown and become fond of Mara and they had become um, an inseparable uh, team um, it was extremely hard for her and also for the owners to make that decision but uh, Mara was was put down uh, after the tragic accident. Um, uh, but uh, during uh, the period that we had Mara, uh, she was also a source of uh, uh, a learning curve for us. Uh, we had learned uh, so much on, on what uh, a working dog uh, program would entail um, and what, you know, what the difficulties were and what was needed to actually actualize uh, a working dog program uh, for for uh, searching for uh, cheetah scat. Next slide, please. Um, just just uh, so that I can I can give everyone a little bit uh, of background on why we decided uh, to focus on uh, cheetah scat. Uh, Cheetahs are uh, extremely, um, during that period, uh, we, we had uh, tried to capture uh, a few cheetahs so that we could put radio collars on um, and also get some blood samples. But outside of protected areas, cheetahs are extremely shy 
and very, very difficult. Um, and also the risks associated with, uh, with, with getting these samples were more, especially for cheaters. Uh, a lot of them tended to overheat and uh, um, during the recovery period, it was also a dangerous time for them where they could be attacked and killed by hyenas or leopard or lions. And uh, so we, with, uh, with, 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 the, with, the, with, the, with the knowledge that we could probably get uh, some or most of the information we needed from actually uh, an invasive way of acquiring it from a cheetah um, and using a non-invasive way of, of getting the same information, um, we decided that the non-invasive way was, was far more uh, practical and easier especially when, when, when you use an animal that has more capability than, than a human being. Uh, so it, between 2011 and 2013, we collected a total of 287 scats. Uh, however, uh, when analysis was done on the hair, only 27 of those could be proved to be cheetah. So out of 227, 260, could not be proved to, to be uh, cheetah scats. So or, uh, when you look at it from a percentage wise, that, that, that was quite low. Um, and, and when you add the time and effort that had been put in place uh, to collect these 287 samples, uh, this was quite difficult. Uh, this was quite, I mean, it was quite a low return on investment. And I think, um, I'm not quite sure whether Paul should be giving this. I think I may have crossed to your <laughs> to your slides, Paul, um, because I, I see your picture on the left hand side of the style oh, of the slide. Uh, however, uh, basically the the manual collection of of uh, cheetah scat was found to be uh, quite ineffective, uh, and the use of dogs uh, became our primary focus and. Um, you know, hiring of of, uh, of uh, fully dedicated uh, dog team uh, began in earnest. Uh, Madi came into uh, SEK in 2015, and I think I will let Paul take it uh, over from here so that he can tell you a little bit more about the training and all the stuff that goes on with the dogs. Um, uh, uh, Jessica, next slide, please. Let's see if it's Paul or so it's still me. Yeah. We can go back. <coughs> it's yeah, mine, Cosmos. Uh... <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> thank you, Cosmos, and thanks to everyone for joining the meeting today. And today I will be talking about how we use the dogs in conservation. And as you know, that it is the nose that is mostly used to sniff out the scat that we go to search for when we are doing our field works. And the dog's nose has uh, like 300 million scent receptors. So as you know, it's probably one of the most accurate way of identifying anything that gives off any scent. Dogs are able to locate scat when obscured. Uh, that can be also seen when we are doing the trainings. We can hide the scat anywhere and the dogs can retrieve them in just a few minutes or a few seconds, depending on the size of the area. And according to the dogs um, searching for scat, it has been shown that they are 96% accurate in detecting the, the scat. Next slide, please. <coughs> when we started our program at ACK, we started with this dog called Madi back in 2015. Madi was the first designated scat dog and was raised for the job. We had consultants from, from Wells Fargo Canine and Bram Dog Kennels who helped with the, the initial training of Madi in order for him to become a scat detection dog. And as you can see, Madi is a mix of a Rottweiler and Border Collie. And I think it was one of the hardest jobs <laughs> to train Madi, but he's one of our best dogs so far. Next slide. 
back in 2017, that's when we got our other dog called Warrior, who has now been retired after doing a lot of fieldwork studies, fieldwork searches. And back in 2017 to 2018, Muddy and Warrior were trained and they did the uh, trials which were conducted at our camp in Salama, Samburu, Galana, and Impala, that is in Laikipia. And we had our first dog handler who was Evans, and he was working with the other team members at ACK to train the dogs and to do the field searches. Next. What we encourage when we are working with the dogs and the trainings with the other staff, the other dog handlers mostly is bonding, which results in positive relationship, the rapport between dogs and humans and the dog. The importance of bonding is that when we are working the dog, we get a strong trust between the dog and the handler. That is the dog can trust the handler and if the handler tells the dog to do something, the dog will surely do what is being told. We also have effective communication with the handler and the dog that comes out with a lot of time invested in the bonding with the dogs during training and searches. We also have correct interpretation of body language. That's whereby the dog handler can be able to read the dog. That is, if there is any scat around, the dog handler must be able to know how the dog reacts, how the body changes of the dog, so that to know if the dog has found traces of any scat scent that is around the area. So that is very vital for the handler to be able to read the dog. We usually feed our dogs high energy foods because as you know, they are working dogs and they really need that energy to perform effectively. We do the grooming every week, that is on Saturdays mostly, whereby we wash the dogs, we give them some bones, give them some rest, and it also helps with the bonding with the dogs also, the grooming part of it. We usually do a lot of uh, long walks with the dogs, agility trainings to make the dogs fit. Next, please. We usually do our obedience training. That is working through distractions. We, it also helps in making sure that even if the dog is far away from the handler, you can recall the dog and the dog can come back to you. We also do our impulse control. That is making sure that the dog can be able to control its impulses. And when we are doing the field searches, the dog cannot go around chasing the other game in the conservancies or the national reserves that we always visit. We also do our training. That is the sit and stay commands whereby if the dog finds the scat that he's searching for, it can be able to sit and stay without getting out of the, out of the scat that it has found. We also employ a lot of agility training to make sure they are fit for the work. We do a lot of lead work with the dogs to make sure that the handler is able to control the dog at all times. We always use also hand signals, mostly when we are doing the off-leash such as that is uh, something like you can maybe lift your hand up and the dog will know what it's supposed to to do what the hand signals means next please we always do our <coughs> scent and indication training whereby we use operant conditioning that involves the play for pay after the dog that is associating ball and target scent and we give the reward after the dog finds the scat that is trained to search for. We usually reward the dog with a ball or a comb, and then we play with the dog, and that's the only way we can pay these dogs. Next. We usually use our, during our center identification training, 
that is target set exercises, whereby at this moment we are training the dogs to look for the cheetah poop. We use the boxes, whereby we put them in one line or just randomly. And where we are in the field, the field searches, especially in our camp here in Nairobi, there is a large field that we usually use. That's why we use the scent cage when we are doing the open field searches to make sure that the, we are sure, 100% sure the dogs can be able to find what they are trained to look for. Next. When we are going to the field searches, we usually have some time for acclimation in the field. That is familiarizing the dogs and handlers to a new working environment. And when we are doing the searches, we usually have one canine, two handlers, that is the ones handling the equipment for, for the searches, um, the GPS equipment and other stuff. We usually have at least one ranger for security purposes when we are doing, we are conducting the searches. And we usually also have around one or two research scientists who helps with the collection of the data that we usually find when we are doing the field searches. Next, please. The search patterns that we usually use, the most one that we use, we use different search patterns to promote effectiveness to the area covered. But the most one we use is usually the grid search, whereby it is used when the area is open and cheetahs have been seen recently in the area. We also use the linear search. We have another one called spot search and another one called circular search. Next, please. Uh, we usually use a lot of linear searches also, uh, mostly grid and linear. Linear is whereby used when the area is less open or when dangerous animals may be around. It's usually um, done using the leash or even off leash. It can also be done off leash. That's what I mean. And next, please. During our field searches with the dogs back in 2019 in Samburu, the dogs were able to find over 90 cheetah samples in just 28 days of field searches in two conservancies and two national reserves. And as Cosmas had earlier told you, the scat that we usually find in the field is usually tells us a lot about the diet, the health and genetics of the cheetahs. Next, please. Back in 2019, we were able to get two more dogs, that is Artie and Percy. They are Belgian Malinois. And we've been, we, they have gone, they have undergone all the trainings required and they have been acclimated to the field for some time. But due to the pandemic, uh, it has really limited our field time with these two dogs, but we hope that in the coming few months, we'll be able to get them back to the, to the field. Next, please. And finally, I want to thank all the advisors and consultants that have really helped us with our dog program, that is KK Security, Working Dogs for Conservation, Brand Dog Kennels, Wells Fargo Canine Unit, and Ultimate Canine Solutions, led by George Caravis, who was the one who donated the two Malinois, that is Art and Percy to us. And finally, Jane Sharp, who is our main consultant when we are we have problems with the trainings, the anything concerning the dogs, and we don't know what to do, we usually consult Jane. So thanks to everyone. And that is the end of my presentation. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cosmos and Paul. What a great presentation. All righty, to wrap up the evening, um, we are going to introduce our last speaker, um, Mike Veal of Global Conservation Force. 
Um, so Mike is the founder and president of Global Conservation Force. In 2014, after years of watching the wild populations of animals under his care rapidly dwindle, Mike decided to take action. His lengthy wildlife care career combined with ex his experience in conservation, working as a ranger in California, an active combat sport heavy lifestyle, it gave Mike the unique experience needed to fight on the front lines of conservation. Mike traveled to South Africa and passed an intensive boot camp training required bef um, before finally becoming an anti-poaching ranger at the Greater Kruger National Park. After several months of working specialized rhino protection detail in counter poaching operations, Mike returned to America and Global Conservation Force was formally founded. He continues to go back and forth between the United States, Asia, and Africa, working on direct impact wildlife conservation project, community based <laughs> conservation programs, and anti -po poaching patrols. Did you get all that, guys? Um, so as a fellow San Diegan, I have seen him speak several times and he is just so inspirational. So everyone welcome Mike. Thanks for the introduction there, Jess. Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so just FYI, I'm doing this from my phone, so I can't see the chat without leaving it. Um, so uh, if there are questions, Jess, maybe you can help me field those. Uh, <clears throat> I'll pull those in. Uh, tonight, you'll probably see Odin, who's my working canine and my ambassador canine for our canine units. Uh, Odin is from the same KMPV Belgian Malinois working lines that we use in Africa. Uh, so Global Conservation Force has a wide throw for our canine operations. Uh, we have canines pretty much working at every capacity of conservation. Now, it's uh, something that helps us as rangers, conservationists, um, field researchers. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you guys probably got caught up well tonight, uh, but our team uses different canines for different purposes. So I'll start with the Belgian Malinois. So Odin's line is very unique in the sense that this specific line it's what's known as the Royal Dutch Police Line. Um, KMPV is a sought after uh, genetics line of Mal Malinois, mainly because they've for a very long time been selectively bred to both scent detect, track, trail, uh, and bite. So uh, you can definitely see that in our dogs. And it's interesting to see that uh, in them versus some of the non KMPV dogs. Um, our Malinois, uh, we imported them all. Um, and a very long story, basically a European championship line with an American championship line. We had a, a cancellation flight and a pregnancy that came early. Uh, and so the dogs were raised in San Diego and then we, we imported them into South Africa. Uh, so we have uh, our team of Belgian Malinois working in uh, scent detection at gates uh, for different illegal products, pangolin, rhino horn, ivory, gun oil, bush meat. Um, some of them are working on tracking as well. So they will be put on a human scent if it's a fresh track in the shorter sense of things. So uh, usually shorter is a couple kilometers. And then we also leapfrog dogs. So one will be on an active trail. Another one will pick up the scent trail and keep going. Um, in which case we are using the Malinois as we're closer because the dogs are dual purpose trained, uh, meaning that they will uh, do bite apprehension work. So we can uh, get a suspect live uh, if it comes to needing the dog. Uh, in a lot of situations with specifically elephant and rhino poaching, they usually are armed or carrying a, a panga or a machete or a knife. So uh, our Malinois range in a different uh, group size from roughly 65 to 85 pounds. Um, they're very lean, but very dense muscular, extremely fast. Um, and then you guys saw a flash there just the scene before that was Thor. He's a Bavarian hound. We're using Bavarian, hound, Bavarian hounds instead of bloodhounds because they are a lot more adapt for the heat. And uh, we found that out actually by a partner of ours that tr decided to try his personal Bavarian hound in the Kruger National Park. 
And so after great success with uh, longer or older scents uh, and scent trails, um, we decided to pick up a Bavarian Hound as well. Um, so our Bavarian Hound actually is set to come down to South Africa after being trained in the Netherlands. And we'll be working on the cold scent, which would be the older scent. So if there's a fence line incursion, then we put the Malinois on it after we got closer to the suspect. Um, and then we also use Dutch Shepherds and English Lab, um, which I don't believe I dropped a picture of Clive in the mix. Uh, but Clive is working on pangolin and turtle uh, based conservation products, uh, sorry, projects <clears throat> and searches for those uh, illegal products or transports or trafficking um, and is just about to actually be working in Southeast Asia. So of our dogs, specifically in our own canine unit, the dogs are working at airports, entries of reserves, in the reserves with rangers, uh, and then on special task force units. So they work jointly with multiple bodies of law enforcement. Um, and looks like I might have to let him out because he's, I think he's got to go potty. So, Odin. <laughs> it's always comical to do the presentation with these guys. Um, so we do, I caught the tail end of the other presentation. We do the same kind of training. Um, it's going to be positive based uh, incentives, awkward conditioning, classical conditioning. Uh, the dog's primary reinforcement is going to be your, uh, you know, ball drive, as we say. So instead of being out in the middle of the bush, uh, the ranger is going to carry a Kong or they're going to carry a, uh, a heavy duty ball. And that's going to be their primary reward after we indicate on a scent or a tracking trail, or even if they are let go on a suspect uh, and there is a live bite, uh, it looks aggressive, seems aggressive, is technically pretty gnarly. Uh, when it gets to that point, but uh, when the handler calls them off, they give them their chew toy and it's like nothing ever happens. Um, so we are working with these different canines for what we call forceful multiplication. So um, how, we, how we have the dogs work in tandem with the rangers, um, it exponentially makes the proactive side more successful. And then when it comes to the active side where there's a situation happening, uh, the success rate of capture and live arrests, uh, non-conflict based arrests uh, go up as well. So we're not, res we're not resolving things in, in gunfire, uh, which is the bigger goal. Uh, so the dogs do have a variety of things. They have their own personalities. They have their own special skill sets. Not every dog is the same. Um, so of Odin's litter, not everybody can bite and not everybody can scent and track uh, the same so we work on primary motivations and fit them to their best uh their best drives so we make sure that they're happy um and we work to pair them with their handlers um and then outside of that with conservation work a big thing that we're also doing is the canine industry itself is not very advanced um so we need to make sure that we advance anti-poaching units and reserves for the capacity of canines so that might be refrigerated vehicle setups. Uh, so AC condition, like, so air conditioning and their kennels, how they prepare their kennels, how the uh, home kennels or non-working kennels are, what they're feeding them, how they exercise them. Um, we do field medical training for rangers and handlers. Uh, we get rangers and different handlers certified by government standard and by field standard with our field instructors. So there's quite a bit going on. Um, and so it's not always just the dogs. Uh, a lot of times we see that the dog is actually three to four times more advanced than the handler. So we do a lot of mentorship in the field as well, getting them caught up to speed. Um, and like I said, I think I'm gonna let Odin out real quick. So let me just open the door, I'll be right back. Sure, Apologize for that. He definitely had to go to the bathroom, so. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're using working dogs in multiple capacities, and then we're working with over 36 different anti-poaching units in Southern, Eastern and, sorry, Southern and Eastern Africa and, uh, Southeast Asia. So the canine world is big, but it's also relatively new for some conservationists. So, uh, we're trying to help grow that to the capacity standard that we would see with, uh, American military and police force, uh, 
so wide variety of things, wide variety of successes. Um, it's really important that we properly set these dogs up before we put them anywhere, even if it's a lab. Um, so we have to work to the breed specifics, work to the personality traits, and then understand the handlers and the conditions. And then usually it takes about a year to six months of pre-work before we place a canine, and then three to six months of post-work after we place a canine. So the canine and the team, whoever is using it, a researcher, a biologist, canine handler for an anti-poaching unit or a customs agent is properly prepared to basically handle the behaviors uh, so they don't lose track of things. Uh, and then next, we continue to stay with them as a mentor uh, because training, training smart dogs and or keeping them trained requires retraining and consistency. And a lot of times, the most simple of mistakes can send a dog off the wrong path for behaviors. And so we're there to help with that too. Um, for the sake of everything, I think I'm gonna just do like two more minutes and I'll take questions. Um, I know you guys are a couple hours in now. Um, so with our efforts, we're working in primarily pangolin, giraffe, rhino, elephant, African painted dog, saiga, and snow leopard crisis habitats, which we use as umbrella protection based efforts for all species in those zones. So we do obviously protect cheetah, lion, leopard, a bunch of other things in those habitats. But what we do is we identify a key crisis habitat and work on the protection of everything with canines, mounted units, rangers, community-based conservation, and everything else in between. So uh, a lot of our canine efforts kind of pair back to our ranger training programs and our ranger hiring programs and our community-based conservation programs. And um, a lot of this also helps the communities develop in the next level of care for wildlife. So especially when uh, someone from the field hasn't had a personal pet, or maybe they didn't have the proper training to care for it as we might, um, you see a change in that family and a change in that community is, becomes a positive. Um, so it's then reflects obviously with the wildlife. So, uh, the canines have been one of our long stead, uh, favorites. Uh, we have been working with canines since 2014. Um, at which point we didn't have our own personal canines, but we were working on different units doing the same thing, just minus our own specific canines. Um, so with that, I saw a couple questions flash through. I, I can't see them. Uh, so Jess, maybe you want to relay those for me and then I can help answer those. I gotcha. Um, so I really like how you place individual dogs with their kind of strengths. I think that's really wonderful. Have you had any dogs fail, quote unquote, the program? And if so, what happens to them? We have. So uh, to, so I'm an animal person. Um, I've worked here in San Diego with multiple NGOs, including being a senior wildlife care specialist. And you know, certain, certain species and certain individuals uh, aren't cut out for certain things. Uh, so in Odin's actual litter, uh, it was a litter of nine. There was one female we actually failed out in the beginning because she appeared to be a runt. <clears throat> now, she wasn't. <laughs> she just was a slower grower, and she actually ended up being bigger than uh, the other females in the field. But we held her out because we were afraid she'd be too small for our uh, dual purpose work, meaning bite work, meaning that putting her through all the stress and trouble of sending her to Africa wasn't worth it for her and for us for the gamble that she might not want to do sense detection and she can't actually be heavy enough to do bite work because uh, some of the poachers we do take on are actually pretty big. Um, so she was a pre-selected fail, but then we actually had males we had two males in the litter who were monster studs i mean they in the first nine months were machines they just wanted to do bite work they wanted they were like ripping out of the kennel to do scent detection and then right about the time that they sexually matured they didn't care anymore and so we used every tool in the toolbox uh we even at some points were using prime cuts of steak uh as motivational uh for scent tracking trails and all that stuff and essentially they didn't have the self they didn't have the self drive to compete and work with us 
And so essentially what we did was we said, okay, well, they, they're going to fail out and we don't really look at this failing out. They're just, they didn't make selection. Um, they didn't make selection. So we had, before we placed the, the every time we do a canine program, we have alternatives. So are they dual purpose? Do they thrive in tracking? Do they thrive in trailing? Do they thrive in scent detection? Um, and then we are also working with uh, different people in the communities for their socialization. So on the weekends, they might go stay at somebody's house who's a sports training dog, a uh, handler or trainer, and or someone who runs livestock and the dogs go out with livestock dogs. And it's so we can have well-balanced dogs. Um, in that process, we're also looking at potential adoption homes. And so with our dogs that fell out of selection, they actually went to somebody who works in the sport training industry in South Africa, uh, who also has a ranch, and then another person who has a Dutch Shepherd who does, uh, for fun on the weekends, uh, competitions. I wouldn't really call him a sport trainer though. Um, so in that case, they, they fell out. Um, a lot of times though, the selection process happens a lot earlier. Um, so you're actually looking for these really strong traits earlier on in their years. And so if they're not really showing that they're going to be, you know, self-driven and motivated, we're, we're definitely not going to force that. And we're not going to try to make them do something that they just don't want to. And unfortunately we do see a lot of that in the field. There are dogs that they should have stayed as a pet instead of a working dog. And so we're trying to help change that too. Um, and so with that, what basically we find them the best home we can and they become an ambassador canine in their region and they sign in as a contract. They go to the new home fixed and uh, fully vaccinated and registered and everything. And they stay in the GCF pedigree if, if they were ours and uh, they have a forever home and then they have a 100 percent guarantee if something doesn't work, they come back to GCF and GCF, have, GCF has three kennel locations in South Africa. So if we need to, we can always bring them back and they'd stay full time with our handlers and trainers at the different uh, project sites. And so that's basically what happens. But in a lot of cases, like I said, the dogs are actually cherry picked. Uh, you'll do like prime pick of the litter and you'll pick the best one and run with that. So that was like Thor's case and Clive's case. Um, the trainer for those actually was on like a five year waiting list and said, hey, Mike, you know, these two came up. I think they'd be perfect for what we've been planning for, you know, these different projects. And I said, okay, look, you want to do a trial? And then they did a trial and they then took them home for the weekend, did another working trial over the weekend in different scenarios and said, you know what, these dogs are the ones. And so instead of putting an entire litter through that, we took just the, the, uh, the, the top of the class essentially. And um, we haven't had any fallout in that, in that mind set. Uh, so it's uh it's it's very interesting because it's much like people um in the sense that you know in ranger camp um not everybody can make it um sometimes there's injuries sometimes there's unforeseen um hereditary issues that might come up later and you've got to go okay for the best of their well-being we're going to pull them from the program um so a lot of nonprofits don't see canines worthy in that sense because they don't want to take the risk but I see them as a reward and you just need to know how to set the program up. So we, we absolutely adore our canines. Sounds like if anyone needs advice, they need to come to you. That sounds like a really great setup. Um, last question. Um, how many teams do you have in the field and what is your hand handler to dog ratio? So we have one primary handler and one alternate handler ratio so that there can be cross training um, in the units. There are going to be others who are trained for canine field first aid and can take the leash, but they won't necessarily be the handler. Um, a lot of areas have legal requirements when you're working in the law enforcement capacity. So for example, if the dog bites someone and you go to court, um, that person needs to be uh, given a DHL, a, a dog handler license. Um, and it's certified level one through five. So it, that categorized how you can um, basically what you're qualified to represent with a canine. Um, GCF has multiple units. We have 
uh, three mounted anti-poaching units. We have four dedicated anti-poaching units that are on foot. And then we have nine different canines who are all individuals acting on units with their handlers, with partners. And then on top of that, we have uh, our other anti-poaching operations. And then we also do have, like I said, our ambassador canines. Um, so Odin works with me on certain things uh, stateside. Uh, and so that's another example. But uh, GCF has quite a few different projects going on. So we also have mobile instructors who on government contract with us work on different programs from different governments for conservation. So we have two alternate international uh, uh, world-class level instructors. So uh, instructors who can train a, any of the specialties, but they specialize in one and then they have their canine too that we can deploy with them. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of us in a nutshell. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And um, do you want to throw out your website or anything? Yeah, if you guys are more interested in uh, finding out about us, uh, you can find us on uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Global Conservation Force uh, with the Rhino Shield. And uh, if you guys are interested about what I'm doing uh, different times, you can find me at Mike Beal on Instagram and on Facebook. And yeah, thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I hope you guys had a good night. Thank you so much, Mike. You're welcome. All righty, guys, that wraps up our presentations for the evening. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we will put our donation information up on the screen again, as well as back into our chat. Um, so feel free if you're, uh, if you're feeling, um, if you're feeling it to um, donate to our cause again these are going to go to vaccinate um, cats and dogs throughout kenya um, if there's any last minute questions anybody has please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll hang out and answer those if not again thank you so much uh cheers for canines and conservation guys and have a wonderful night <laughs>